and welcome to another episode of the CEO Peak. I am Dave Osh, the CEO of Valinx that sponsors this show. We partner with leadership teams to create transformative change in high complexity and uncertainty. Our purpose is to evolve leadership effectiveness so that together we create a ripple effect of unity in the world. The CEO Peak Show is devoted to sharing the thought leadership of successful leaders who are aligned with our purpose. Such a leader is our guest today, Ron Cheese, the president and CEO of Andesa. Andesa provides comprehensive integrated policy and plan administration and support solutions for life insurance and annuity carriers and producers. It offers a suite of services to surf software as a service and business process outsourcing models using cloud technology. Ron was promoted to CEO 10 years ago after serving for almost five years as the company's CFO. Prior to Andesa, Ron had a career in corporate finance after a few years as an audit manager for Ernst & Young. I invited Ron to the show after reading his article about his cruise vacation in, to Alaska with his wife, Catherine. So I really love polar bear stories, but Ron actually wrote about the leadership angle of a medical evacuation from the ship. I was fascinated by the ability to assess leadership, not only at work, but in everyday situations. So, well, Alaskan cruise isn't an everyday situation. So, hello, Ron, and welcome to the show. Hi, Dave, and, and really appreciate you reading my blog. <laughs> Actually, it was a really great article. So, what was it the one-time event, or do you often look for leadership experiences outside work? I do look for them inside the company. And so, so the blog I write, which appears on our website, I try to write about my experiences or, or people within my companies. But I've always kind of got my eyes open, um, you know, for just different stories and different experiences. So, again, just happened to be on this Alaskan cruise. We had to evacuate a passenger for a medical emergency. And I was just impressed with how the, the captain you know, uh, got all of us. I mean, we were all part of that mission at the end. And, and I was just impressed by the, the leadership lessons of, of that situation. Um, another blog I wrote, I was on vacation. They, they seem to come up when I'm on vacation a little bit, but I was at the beach and I was watching a beach replenishment project by the Army Corps of Engineers. And again, just witnessing how they were going about their work and, and how it reminded me of uh, certain leadership lessons I've learned over the years and, and use that uh, analogy as, uh, as fodder for, for my writing. So, so you know, prior to this uh, podcast, we talked about uh, finding your purpose and you share with me what you did with yourself and how you help your employees to find their own purpose. I wish we talked about this more with our youth, um, you know, as, as you're going into school, as you're going into college, as you're emerging into your first businesses, like, why? What, what, what's, what's your real purpose? Like, that's where it starts. And, and I think so many of us, um, you, you know, emulate somebody we admire and, and we pursue something because, you know, we think that there's going to be money in it or, or we think like, oh, I enjoy doing this, so I'm going to spend some time in it. But but you really got to get at the heart. You really got to get at the why. And, and I think um, it takes a while to do that. It takes a lot of self-awareness, a lot of self-reflection. It's like, why does this matter? Um, one of those, I, one of those um, cathartic moments for me once was when we used Clifton Strengths Finders. And somebody shared with me, like, you know, do the survey. Here's your top five. Read, do the research on who, who you are, what, what this, what this is. And, and I'm reading it and I'm like, boy, if I would have just known this earlier, I would have maybe made different decisions or I, it, you know, as I was reading, it was clarifying decisions that I had made in my life to pursue certain things versus not pursue certain things. And I think the more that we find our purpose and the more time we dedicate to pursuing that purpose, the more fulfilled we are. The better, the better we serve, the better, you know, the better impact we make. And so again, I, I have found that a good por a portion of my purpose is helping others 
truly find why they're wired the way they are, who who they are, what their purpose is, and to spend more time pursuing your purpose rather than trying to fix something that isn't even what you should be spending your your precious few hours on. And how do you align those different purposes from the organizational purpose? So in any organization, there are different skills, there are different talents, there are different requirements. Um, you know, I'll go back to my days in public accounting. You know, we had tax accountants, we had auditors. And tax accounting, I couldn't do. Uh, it just was not something that, you know, appealed to me. It was you know, it was, it was methodical. It was, it, and yet people who are great tax experts, you just love having in your, in your corner. Um, I enjoyed the auditing side. My number one talent, according to Clifton Strengths Finders is learner. I love to learn. And, and so, you know, the, the auditor in me, I was going in and examining a new business. I was learning about what made that business work. I was learning about how the numbers translated into their success or, or their challenges. And, and, you know, so constantly using what I did, what, what my purpose is, what, what my skill sets are, you know, to greater work. And again, for the tax accountants, you know, they have a different, um, you know, what, what strength or what skill set they might have. So I think in a business, it's really trying to find out what somebody is strong at, what they enjoy doing, finding ways to give them more opportunities to do that. And to really, the other side of that is diminishing or, or, or preventing them, uh, from doing things that where they're being drained by their energy. And, and, and I think if you're in a role, and you look at the end of a week and you're energized about what you just spent your time on and what you've accomplished and what you've built and, and, and how you've worked, you're, you're probably working on things that maximize your strengths and fulfill your purpose. If you're leaving the, the job at, on a Friday um, and you're just exhausted, you're, you're probably working on things that aren't really maximizing your purpose or, or fit your strengths. And, and you really should do that soul searching work to say, you know, what, why am I here? What, what am I doing? How am I adding value? I love it. How, how to maximize your purpose in the organization. What a beautiful way. Okay, but think about how hard that is for a college student, right? This is why I love to tell college students, do an internship, do multiple internships, right? Because what you're trying to do is learn what it is about this role that I'm going to thrive in. Right. So the story I love to tell about internships is my wife's own experience. Um, she wanted, she majored in communications. She, um, wanted to work in Manhattan in advertising. As, as a junior in college, she got an internship with a advertising agency. And you know what she discovered? She absolutely hated it. Right. So here you are now, three years of study towards something that you think you want to do. And now you realize like, oh my God, this is not what I want to do. And somebody said to her, well, you know, why don't you look at management? Why don't you look at retail management? And back in the, in the eighties, she, she landed a job out of college with a retail company that invested in management training. She became a department manager and then ultimately a store manager and a regional manager. Today, she owns her own business. She owns two, two consignment stores. So, so like she found her purpose by experimenting and by doing something that she thought she wanted to do, doing that internship and learning. I'm not going to be fulfilled doing this, even though that's what she thought she wanted. And I, I do think that a lot of, um, a lot of people don't spend that time looking at what makes me tick. What, what, why? Why do I want to do this? And they just choose a career or they choose something. I, I chose accounting because I was good in math. It made sense then for me, but, but that was my selection. It was, it was something that was going to help me. Yeah, that's interesting. It happened in our family too. Computer science graduate to 2020. Now I want to change to psychology. Yeah. And, but what you said actually, especially in a complex world, when you look what is the agile leadership, it's all about experiments, right? So what you said is exactly the same, you know, just everything that we need to do, we need to experiment rather than build these huge plans to move forward, right? Yeah, so I told you my number one skill was learner. My number five talent, according to Clifton, is activator. 
So I love to start things, right? I may not, I may not be great at completing them, but I love to start them. And, and oftentimes the reason I start things is just to learn more, right? So, I, you know, how many times do we plan a product? How many pl- times do we plan a new market? And, you know, two months into a project, we realize we missed an assumption. And, and so for me, planning is always sort of that emergent process. Let's start this. Let's get information. Let's learn. Let's, you know, we know where we're going, but, you know, we know directionally where we're going. But let's constantly be trying to improve this by what we're learning along the way. And the only way you can do that sometimes is by by that starting and and failing fast, you know, either either hitting it or failing fast and and just constantly trying to improve. As long as you're trying to make the ultimate goal, you know, then all of that information is advancing you towards that that objective. Yeah, Ron, you know, we, we both started our careers in accounting and finance. And it was pretty hard for me, actually, to make a breakthrough to, from a number person perception. How was your journey? Yeah. <laughs> well, we do, right? We start with numbers and they, and they become our, our, our lens by which we look at everything, right? So when, when we're sitting, especially in that CFO seat, I, I think, you know, so finance CFO, we, we're looking at the business and we're looking at it through the numbers. That becomes the primary purpose of the role. And I think the, the, the journey for me changed when I made that, I had that promotion to CEO because, um, it, it really became more about the people. I, I was, um, I was blessed to be able to join Andessa. Our founder, um, John Walker, who was an economist by training. You know, always had this purpose of this of of Andessa. The purpose of our company is helping our employees uh, find their true potential and reach their true imp- potential, and then helping our clients do the same. And, and, and so he was always a people first manager. He was always a people first individual. And so making the jump from finance to CEO, um, you know, I had one of those moments where I thought I was leading right. I thought I was doing all the right things. And then we did an employee engagement survey and, and we didn't score that high. We invested in leadership development um, in order to better prepare the organization to be more people first. And, and so for me, it really was one of those, again, moments in my career, you know, that sh- just shifted. Like I was no longer responsible for the numbers. I was responsible at the time for 140 families um, that this company was helping. Um, and, you know, it just, it really became a people focus versus a numbers focus as a result of that promotion. That's so profound, you know, that the realization that you don't have 140 employees, you have 140 families. That's a big difference in the way that you look at the world. It absolutely is. And then, you know, then, then put your company in the middle of a broader ecosystem, right? So it's not just our employees, but we also have 17 clients and what we do for them, um, impacts their lives. What, what the suppliers that we have and how they, you know, interact with us, the consultants that we use and that we interact with, we, you really do have a bigger footprint than just even your employee base. You know, we, we spoke before about uh, trapped in this command and control, and you think that this model has to be changed in corporations. So how do companies actually make the shift? I think we're taught that way. I, I, I think there's, um, th- there's certain lessons that we think about what a leader is supposed to be and, and you know, like the person who just directs. And, and by the way, there are, there are situations and there are times when I take control and there are times when I am very directional and, 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 you know, this is a, a crisis is a time for directional, um, command and control leadership. I, I certainly have been more command and control during the COVID situation, um, just to make sure that we could navigate through that. Um, but I, I, I really prefer the model of leadership that is servant leadership, that the purpose of leadership is here to serve others and to find a way that we collaborate. It takes longer, but 
you know, everybody contributes, every voice is heard. And by working together, we come up with a better solution than any one person can come up with. Um, so, you know, but again, I think when we think about leaders, we, we think about people who are truly command. I mean, we get a lot of leadership lessons from military. We, we get a lot of our leadership lessons from, from individuals during times of crisis, during times of difficulty. And, you know, we don't study as much and, or, or, or we don't read as much about the leader that just, you know, quietly navigates their company to greater and greater and greater things over time. And so, you know, again, I think that whole concept of serving others um, is part of who I am. But but again, I think it's a model of leadership that is uh, is beneficial for us. Um, so we our, our company this past year, we switched um, to 100% owned by the employees. We, we did a transaction and became a, a employee owned through a, an employee stock option, uh, our employee stock ownership program in ESOP. And, you know, again, it's, it's one of those models of ownership. It's one of those, like, like my employees now are the beneficiaries of this company. So command and control, you know, doesn't necessarily work in that structure. It, it really is a partnership of me helping serve the employees, reach their potential, and the company now reach its potential because we're all in this together. And I think by aligning the economic incentives with the leadership incentives, it's, it's a better model um, than what I think of as, as traditional business, traditional um, capital that's taught necessarily in, in our schools and, 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 you know, even again, all the books and all the leadership lessons I've learned over a, a long career. That's a major change in every organization. And what, what you did with the company is kind of very rare. Many companies actually fail to move their ownership to employees. I think your point is really, really important. Um, you know, Simon Sinek in his book, The Infinite Game, um, he talks about, you know, like companies stop. They just like the game, the, the game of business. And I don't know that business is a game, but you, you know, like people just stop playing, right? So you sell the company and you exit the game and that's how you end. Well, if you really have spent your career building something, you want to, you want that legacy. You want to perpetuate that. What better way than to have the people that are building the value benefit by that? Model. And, and so again, when we studied, you know, succession at Endesa with the original investors, the original owners, ESOP for us became just a natural model for us to transfer the ownership. Um, so, you know, could we have sold? Could we have exited? Absolutely. Would it have made sense? Not for who we are. That's a full alignment between the purpose and an exit, for example, or type of an exit. So that's a, a beautiful way to look at it. Yeah. So. Ron, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thanks, Dave. Yeah. Bye-bye. See you on the next episode.